uh, thank you, Chair, and let me apologize for being late. Uh, I've, um, I mean, I was, uh, the, the paper or, the, or this work in progress is largely about uh, Japan and India and the global order. And uh, in the context of um, the symposium, I think uh, it's possible that a number of these issues would have been discussed in different contexts. But I think the, uh, the, the frame of reference that I'm using is to look at uh, uh, the, the convergence between the two countries. And there has been an extraordinary convergence over the last uh, few, de few decades that we have seen. Uh, and to uh, sort of look at the, the normative arguments that are being put forth uh, about the uh, issues pertaining to global order, uh, which is very interesting because if we look at the Indo-Japanese relationship per se, uh, there are a range of factors across uh, various levels. Uh, we, can, uh, we can examine uh, this relationship. Uh, and uh, th all these factors point to a significant convergence, whether, uh, whether we are looking at the dom uh, domestic political one, where um, whether we are looking at economic complementarities, changing demographic profiles, changing domestic political attitudes in each, uh, in each of these countries vis-a-vis -vis each other, uh, or we look at the individual level variables where the leadership has played a very important role uh, in sustaining or in, in propelling this relationship from just being a relationship uh, that was muddling along to a relationship that has a very, very strategic dimension today. Uh, I think uh, both the domestic political as well as the individual level variables have been a, uh, very successful in generating a momentum behind this relationship. But I think these two variables uh, at the domestic political and at the individual level are largely nested uh, in, a, in a structural environment and in, in, in a structural set of variables that perhaps are key uh, in terms of generating these ideas, these normative ideas, these uh, ideational uh, views about the global order and India and Japan's role in that global order. And I think both of them are equally important uh, in, in, their own, in, the, in their own right to be, uh, to be able to um, take this relationship forward. And there, uh, if, if uh, you know, when we talk of the global order in which this, these, these variables are nested and we, when we talk of the global uh, structural environment in which India and Japan are nested, uh, I think uh, uh, that structural environment itself uh, becomes a driving factor. And what is fundamentally what we, what we are talking about, we are talking about a structural shift in global politics. Uh, and if this, this shift is towards east, then I think India and Japan uh, have become uh, sort of almost the uh, emblematic of that shift. Uh, Japan, of course, uh, has been a part of, of long-standing uh, pride in, in Asia. It has uh, been uh, for more than a century, Japan had dominated Asia first as an imperial power and then as a country uh, that was the first country, first Asian country to achieve the level of de developments that most Western de developed countries had, achi had achieved. So I think in that context, Japan was already playing a very significant role in this shift that began when can look at the shift uh, from the West to, to the East by looking at Japan's rise and all the talk of uh, in the 80s about J where Japan might be and what it might do at one point even to the US supremacy in the, in the global order. So I think that shift that, that, that shift towards East owes uh, in, in large part to what Japan has been able to do uh, for the region and propel the region um, towards uh, economic prosperity. And now, of course, it's, it's the turn of China in many, in many ways, which is leading the way and shaping uh, our responses uh, to, this, to this global order. Now, uh, there are two dimensions here. One is, of course, China's rise itself in terms of power transition and how it is shaping uh, the, uh, how it is building pressure on, on the institutions, how it is building pressure on, on the certain norms. I think the last session was on, uh, was on the um, maritime order and how that, that is being um, the, the whole idea behind the law of the sea and the whole idea about, about freedom of navigation uh, is being challenged or is being questioned in ways that we have not seen in the, in the last six decades. But I think there is another dimension, which is the dimension of the, of the existing power, extant power, and that is uh, America and what is, um, what is America's role. And I think that shift has been equally evident. Uh, and that shift goes all the way back to, uh, uh, to Clinton. We often blame um, um, uh, you know, in, in 
there's a tendency now to talk of, of Donald Trump as if retreat of America started with Donald Trump. But I think if you look at successive administrations, uh, the trajectory of American response has been very clear, that it is never, it is not going to be uh, the most important player pulling all the uh, strings in Asia Pacific, but redefining the terms of its engagement in the, in the larger Asia Pacific or the Indo-Pacific as, as it's now called. Uh, one can recall George W. Bush, for example, despite uh, his shift towards a focus on the Middle East, uh, talking of uh, in Asia where Asians themselves are pulling mu much of their weight. And he was uh, his administration was the first one that came out very strongly in support of a very assertive Japan, a Japan that can um, do a lot for the region, that, that should be able to do more for the region. And I think that element continued. Uh, under Obama, uh, whether we look at pivot or uh, the uh, what was later uh, rechristened as uh, the strategic uh, the strategic rebalance uh, to a to Asia Pacific, or now under Trump, Trump, uh, you know, he he he's not a very uh, he can't express himself very well. But uh, I think the larger point of his uh, of his idea is that. Uh, Asians should be doing more. Uh, they sh the burden sharing approach to to uh, to, uh, to security uh, and to uh, economics, I think, is a, is a, is a, is a continuation of, of successive administrations gradually shifting their posture towards towards Asia in that direction. Because inevitably, the idea was that if, if China is rising and if, if China's rise has to be managed, it will have to be managed by regional states pulling greater weight uh, and sharing greater burdens. And then I think it gets also reflected in the way states have responded themselves. So you have Japan, which is gradually coming out of its, uh, of its military uh, bunker. You have uh, India, which is recognizing the need for this change uh, in the region. So I think there, there is that complementarity where the idea today has, if, if you just look at the idea of Quad, uh, the idea has emerged uh, or, or re reintroduced into the global mat matrix after the uh, uh, victory of Shinzo Abe. So in that sense, Japan was leading the way. Japan is also leading the way in terms of articulating the need for a TPP minus America. So th in that sense, the pressure is now on, on, on the local, on the regional powers to articulate a response to this shift, shift, uh, uh, shift of, of which, which, manif which is manifesting itself in, in China's rise. <coughs> and a shift uh, which is manifesting itself in, in gradual American retreat and a gradual American uh, re-establishment of, of its presence in the region. So I think that in itself uh, presents <coughs> a set of challenges um, to, uh, to countries like India and Japan. And there we have seen significant convergence in the way uh, today these countries have, are approaching uh, various issues of the of global order. Because if you are looking at it structurally, then the relationship cannot primarily be bilateral. And that is reflected in uh, successive joint statements, where the joint statements now talk of a global partnership. It's not simply a bilateral strategic partnership, but a partnership that goes beyond just bilateral issues um, into a larger global framework. And that, that, res that is a response to the larger global order changes that we are witnessing. So in that, in, in that context, if, uh, if you look at um, uh, some of the specific issues, <coughs> and there, if you're looking at the security ma matrix, there, uh, what has been interesting, if you read these documents carefully, is the evolution in, Amer in India's position and an evolution in J Japan's position on, on key issues of global order. And here I would put, um, uh, first and foremost, from India's perspective, which is an interesting uh, development, is this issue of terrorism and how India, in the last, at least in the last three, four years, has been very vocal about the need with its bilateral partners and multilateral partners about the need for terrorism to be front and center in any relationship. And I think that uh, <coughs> for a country like Japan, which has not looked terrorism very seriously, which, which is not burdened by this uh, force of terrorism to a, to, to a degree that perhaps countries in South Asia are, gradually acknowledging and, and, and resonating and, and re-emphasizing, underscoring uh, the challenges that India is facing. So if you, if you read these documents, they carefully uh, come from a point where these documents are talking of terrorism very generically to a position where now specific countries are mentioned, specific organizations are mentioned, uh, of course, under, because India is uh, gearing up uh, on the front. And I think, but, but the reflection is in, uh, from, but the reaction from Japan is interesting because Japan is responding that this is, uh, this is a challenge of a global order. And even if Japan is maybe a marginal player in this, Japan has to respond to this challenge. So therefore, this is being reflected in how India and Japan are sh shaping their relationship and, 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 and bilateral partnership getting infested uh, getting um, 
uh, getting shaped by what is happening in the larger, wider um, uh, ecosystem. And therefore, uh, I mean, this, uh, and I start with terrorism because terrorism, uh, when we talk of India-Japan relationship, terrorism is not something that is often at the top of the agenda. But if you look at the bilateral statements, uh, it is very interesting to see this evolution in Jap Japan's response to terrorism. Uh, and how Japan has gradually now come to, a, to an understanding which is very similar to India's, that this is a global problem, this has to be sorted globally, uh, and this has to be sorted with a certain degree of conviction, and specifically naming certain actors uh, who perhaps uh, need to be uh, taken into account. And then, uh, of course, uh, if you move from there to, uh, you know, and certainly this is also related to this issue of, uh, um, of larger regional problem areas. So, uh, for example, Afghanistan is now a big part of these uh, statements and how uh, Japan wants to play a role. Uh, some, uh, Japan has played a, some role in, in Afghanistan um, bilaterally between, uh, in, in the context of Japan-Afghanistan relations. But I think if you look at Japan's interest and engagement now with Chabahar project, it also tells you another story about how Japan is linking up. Uh, in terms of not only connectivity here, but also this idea that the terrorism and security issues in the larger matrix need to be understood uh, in a context which perhaps earlier on were, were not there on the table. Similarly, for India, uh, if you see the, uh, if you read these joint statements and if you see how uh, strident now India's position has become, at least in the bilateral statement on North Korea, and this is a reflection of Japanese priorities. That here is a priority that Japan wants to emphasize, and and, and this is suddenly now a global order problem. This is a problem partly because Japan feels this is very important and so India has to respond, but also uh, India's own uh, ideas about itself uh, as a nuclear power, as a responsible nuclear actor, propelling India in, in a direction where it is also now willing to take on um, this, uh, this issue of North Korea and talking about North Korean successive statements uh, about what needs to be done and how uh, international peace and security are threatened by North Korean behavior. Now. Uh, now, these two issues are something that, uh, you know, that, that are not uh, there in, in terms of the bilateral engagement at the, at the top of the agenda for India or for, or for Japan. But then uh, the, the, the issue that has been at the, at the forefront has been the maritime order, the problem of, of what to do with in, in the maritime domain. And there, I think the earlier uh, presentation uh, was um, laid out the contours of that argument in the so, insofar as the problem exists in, in the region. But if you look at, the, uh, at how India and Japan have responded to that uh, to that problem, which basically is a problem of China, uh, ex China's expansionist claims uh, in South China Sea uh, and East China Sea. Uh, the argument, the narrative, the normative uh, frame is that, uh, that that has been used is that we are looking for uh, you know advancing peace, stability, and prosperity in the world through an interconnected uh, uh, Pacific and Indian oceans, and therefore. Uh, effective implementation of certain normative uh, of certain normative discourse is important, whether it's the law of the sea, whether it's the um, uh, code of conduct in the, in the South China Sea, etc. And there, uh, the idea that this has to be linked with a reinvigoration of, this, of the regional security architecture. Again, uh, the, the security architecture in ASEAN, in ASEAN-related uh, institutional framework, is important for India partly because, of course, India has its own uh, set of relationships in East and Southeast Asia, but largely because uh, we are looking at a region that is uh, devoid of effective institutional mechanisms. So I think this, this argument uh, that is coming out um, that it needs to, uh, that India and Japan needs to work towards building this regional architecture is also uh, ultimately a global order issue. That, uh, that a space uh, uh, which is uh, which is now being created, uh, uh, which uh, a vacuum that is now being felt uh, in, in in the larger Indo-Pacific, uh, with regard to institutions, need to be filled up, and both have taken positions on this. Uh, and of course, then there is this issue of Quad, where um, um, which is uh, which is again an inter interesting one. And I think the um, again the frame that is that has been used in in subsequent um, ministry um, uh, official documents. Uh, uh, in, in support of, of the Quad meeting that just took place recently. Uh, so India argued, and, and very similarly um, uh, Japan argued, uh, that uh, th this was important from the perspective of upholding rules-based order, respect for international law, ensuring freedom of navigation, uh, and, and, and India talked of terrorism, and Chinese, China talked of uh, nuclear proliferation from North Korea, but largely the nest is that this is, uh, this is something that we are doing um, because it is important for, for, for regional rules-based order. And this is again a frame that India and Japan, given their uh, strengths and, uh, and uh, given where they are coming from, given their institutional, uh, domestic political institutional framework, are very uh, 
can can easily make uh, and 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 also can um, can make by distinguishing themselves vis-a-vis -vis China. So I think uh, that uh, that element is there. And finally, uh, the issue of connectivity, which is which is our you know the buzzword these days. If you look at what is and there is a there is I think one of us uh, uh, someone is talking about AGC here. Um, but uh, if you if you think in terms of uh, what China is offering to the world, uh, you know we may criticize it, we may we may say you know it's very problematic. Uh, but it's a very ambitious program, and it's only only one on the table at the at, the, at this point. So if you go from Central Asia to Eastern Europe, uh, it, it, it has created a lot of buzz. It may not ref, you know ultimately it may not get reflected on the ground, but that should not take away from the fact that China is offering something very interesting at this point uh, to a large part of the world. And that means that you can only counter it at the ideational level. It cannot be countered similarly by saying that oh, it, it is not going to work, that you know it, it is flawed. So I think the approach that India and Japan seem to be taking, for example, via AAGC, uh, in, um, is, is an argument about uh, again, ensuring that this is going to be different. Our normative approach towards this is going to be different compared to what Chinese approach is going to be. So in this sense, um, you know, uh, talking of transparency, um, non-exclusivity, ensuring uh, territorial uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity, again, differentiating yourself from another, uh, from, from what the Chinese might be, might be offering. So in, in, in that sense, what, uh, what I think um, uh, I sort of I, I wanted to do was uh, to sort of frame the Indo-Japanese relationship uh, uh, in the larger structural context and frame it in, in terms of the frame that they are using uh, to now uh, uh, increasingly they are using to shape their bilateral partnership and taking it from purely bilateral to a more uh, global partnership and therefore this idea that India and Japan are now global powers and they have to offer something at the, at the global order, both uh, something at the regional level or, uh, uh, as well as at the global level. Uh, I'll end there but um, we'll hopefully have a discussion. Uh, thank you, Dr.